So we're going to start on the urinary system. We're going to go kind of quick because this, this part at the beginning is pretty, uh, pretty easy. Okay. So urinary system, its overall function as a total system is to remove nitrogenous waste from the blood. Okay. And eliminate it from the body. So it filters the blood of any break broken down metabolic waste products. Okay. Metabolic waste is produced from all cells of the body. It gets to the blood and then it goes to the kidney and is removed. Okay. It's eliminated in the form of urine. Okay. And so the kidney does the work of filtering and removing the waste, the ureters, the urinary bladder, transport that waste, store it respectively, and then remove it through the urethra. Okay. Here is your urinary system. Two kidneys, two ureters, bladder, and urethra. Okay, we're going to go through a little bit more of the anatomy of the kidney. All right, the kidney is bean-shaped. It has a hilum, little indentation on the on either on the medial side that allows for uh, blood vessels to enter and exit, and also the ureter to exit. Okay, on top of the kidney, so the little top hat is the adrenal gland. Adrenal glands produce a uh, number of hormones and they're in the kidney for a reason because they also is where aldosterone is produced. Okay, you'll notice that off the uh, descending aorta is the renal artery. That's the, the blood vessel that goes to the kidney and the one that leaves is the renal vein and enters the inferior vena cava. The ureters exit on either side and then uh, attached to the bladder the bladder is in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It can distend, all right, so it has a unique epithelial covering on the inside that allows it to stretch but still maintain a boundary between the urine that's, been, that's being stored and the underlying cells. That is a transitional epithelium that stretches with that. Okay, there's a couple muscles uh, and other voluntary muscles and um, involuntary muscles, smooth muscles that are present within the urinary bladder little email message, don't worry about it, um, that when there is voiding of the bladder, meaning expulsion of, ur of urine through the urethra, right, those contract and force urine out through the urethra, and there's both uh, relaxation of sphincter muscles that allow that to occur, okay? The kidney is what we call retroperitoneal. It's behind the peritoneum. That's why you see it on, the, on that right side there, peritoneum is present, is, and then the ureters actually go into on the inside of the peritoneum and then down through the bladder. Okay, this is what it looks like on the cadaver. Pull back, you can see you have your kidney, hilum, blood vessels enter and exit. These are the, that's a ureter, and it looks like the bladder's been distended or it's been it's relaxed, right? Meaning it's closed after dehydration. Questions on the overall structure of the system? Okay, from the back side, you actually can see that the right kidney sits a little bit lower than the left kidney. Uh, there is some protection that, that's involved for the kidneys themselves. They are stuck in a, they are encapsulated. They have a fibrous capsule on the outside. And then outside of that is a fat pad which helps cushion and protect them as well. And then you can see they sit underneath the um, ribs, the 11th and 12th ribs on either side, okay? The kidneys, the kidneys are the working, functioning organs of the urinary system. And they have more than just one function in terms of producing urine, right? So with the production of urine, as, as um, an aside to that, it also controls water balance, okay? You know when you drink a lot of water, what do you, what happens? You need to go to the bathroom more, right? You are well hydrated, you produce more urine, okay? You are less hydrated, you produce less urine. So it regulates water balance. Really, though, it's regulating blood volume, okay? because you're gonna consume water and that's gonna be absorbed into the blood, 
right, from the digestive system, and that's going to increase your blood volume. More blood volume leads to increase in blood pressure, okay, because cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate, right? Yes, you agree with that? So if I increase blood volume by consuming water, what happens to my stroke volume? John, it goes up. Stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up, and if cardiac output goes up, what happens to blood pressure? Cardi blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance, right? So if my cardiac output goes up, what happens to blood pressure? It increases. And if blood pressure increases, the kidneys work to maintain blood pressure as well, okay? So all of that is, is related. So now these two things regulate water levels, blood volume, also helps regulate blood pressure. That those two things are very quick, closely related, okay? And we've already talked about number four, kidneys regulate red blood cell production, okay, because they produce erythropoietin. When there's a diminished capacity for the blood to bind oxygen, that is, that is a stimulus for the production and release of erythropoietin, which will produce, will stimulate the production of more red blood cells, okay? The kidneys also regulate acid-base balance, and so we'll talk about that as part of chapter 25, right? And they'll work to excrete hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, and ammonia ions, right? H plus, HCO3 negative, and H4. And then elimination of biology, biologically active molecules, right? Hormones, drugs, right? Metabolites. So, you know, one of the worst things that you can do is for your kidneys is to overuse of over counter drug over the counter drugs such as um, Advil or um, ibuprofen. Okay, my sister-in-law, okay, in her in her infinite wisdom, went in with a, a kidney problem, went into the hospital with a kidney problem last October. Okay, because. She has a very chronic, painful shoulder that she was managing with taking 12 to 15 Advil a day. And so after a few months of doing this, her kidneys were not feeling so hot, okay? So think about that's kind of like the, all of that stuff, all of that Advil needs to be processed by the liver and those metabolites need to be eliminated by the body, okay? And so she's putting, she put way too much pressure, way too much stress on her kidneys, and they were returning the favor by shutting down on her, okay? And other, you know, other molecules are involved with that. Here's the structure of the kidney cut in half, cortex and medulla, the fibrous capsule on the outside, the cortex is where most of the neurons are found. Uh, neurons, <laughs> nephrons are found, okay? Most of the nephrons are found. You have renal pyramids. These are little triangle things here. Okay, these are renal pyramids. This is your, the junction between those, what we call the cortical medullary junction. The area between the pyramids is the column, okay? Um, and then you have uh, this area in the middle, that's the renal pelvis. At the end of the pyramid is what we call a minor calyx. That is where urine is, most urine is produced in the cortex, and then it's collected down the pyramids and into the minor calyx. A couple, and then that minor calyx fuses into a bigger area called the major calyx, and eventually into the larger area before it leaves um, the kidney in the ureter called the renal pelvis. Okay, so you have the renal sinus contains minor and major calyces in the renal pelvis, so all of this right here. So when your dissections, okay, of the, your kidney in lab, when you cut that in half, all of that yellow stuff was in, that yellow latex was where urine would be produced, all right, or where it would be collected, okay? So that would be all of where that yellow material would be, would be called the renal sinus. All right, you see the renal artery, renal vein, and then 
as blood comes in from the renal artery, it separates and it breaks down, sends out in numerous vessels, eventually getting to the nephron, which we'll talk about next. Any questions on ki uh, kidney anatomy up to here or urinary system anatomy up to here? No? Good. So, blood supply. So the function of the kidney is to filter the blood, so we have to have a very robust blood supply in order to do that, okay? So if you follow this around from clockwise from starting at, over here at renal artery, all right, and follow it around, we will get to the point where we get actually follow blood through the whole kidney. So renal artery, and then it breaks into, a seg into two segmental arteries. Interlober, the kidney is divided into lobes. Okay, so interlober, it goes between the lobes. All right, and then arcuate, you'll see the arcuate one kind of runs over the renal uh, pyramid. Okay, arcuate artery to an interlobular. All right, interlober and interlobular are two different things. Interlobular artery, and then gets to a point where we are into the arterial blood, and there are two distinct arterioles that are important. The afferent arteriole, okay, afferent means incoming, and it's incoming into this, to this structure called the glomerulus right here, okay? The glomerulus. The glomerulus is a ball, a knot, so you can see it right here, all right, right here. It's a knot of capillaries. These capillaries are fenestrated. What does fenestrated capillaries, what do they do? What does that mean? They're leaky, okay? They have pores on them and they're leaky. So any pressure that goes, any blood pressure that goes in through there, it's kind of like um, taking a garden, ho garden hose and punching hose in, holes into it and then turning the faucet on. What's gonna happen? Right, water's gonna come, fluid is gonna come out. And that's what happens here, okay? So afferent arterial into the glomerulus, and the glomerulus is the, is the area, the spot where urine production begins, okay? That is the area where urine production starts. Okay, well we're talking about blood here, so we'll come back to the glomerulus in a second. All right, so that is a capillary network in the glomerulus, all right? And blood runs through actually two capillary networks as it goes through the kidney. Number one is the glomerulus. Number two is down here, the peritubular capillaries, okay? So we'll come back to peritubular capillaries in a second. So we go afferent arterial glomerulus, and then blood leaves again through an efferent, efferent arterial. Efferent means outgoing, okay? Why is it important that they're arterioles? What do you know about the function of arterioles as opposed to why isn't that a venule that's leaving there? Why is it an arterial? What do arterioles do that, do that venules and arteries don't? And that's going to be very important for the function of the nephron and the kidney. What do arterioles control? Blood pressure. And how do they control blood pressure? What's the, what's the big thing that they do that arterioles do to control blood pressure? They vasoconstrict and vasodilate. Okay? So the fact that these two vessels, incoming and outgoing, are, they are arterioles, what by, the, by their function, what, or by their structure, what can they do? Vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Okay? So if an afferent arterial constricts, less blood gets into the glomerulus. If an efferent arterial constricts, more blood stays in the glomerulus longer. All right? It is a way of actually controlling blood that goes in and out of this functional unit. Okay? And it's very important when we, when we start talking about the, what's happening at the glomerulus. Okay? So 
blood ent exits from uh, the glomerulus from the efferent arterial and then e enters a secondary um, capillary network called the peritubular capillaries. There's a bunch of capillaries that are wound around the functioning unit of the kidney, the nephron. Okay, and there's actually another one, uh, vasa recta is, an, is a, an extension of that peritubular capillary network. Okay, so it's an, an extension and that's part of the, the nephron loop. So really you have this peritubular capillary network which is around the uh, proximal convo, one, two parts of the nephron and the vasa recta which is another, around another part of the nephron. And then we get back from there, blood then enters the venule side, the interlobar vein, arcuate vein, or excuse me, interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, renal vein out of the kidney. Okay, so blood in, the pathway in, pathway out. They are basically the same on the way in and on the way out, right? So if you looked at interlobar, arcuate, interlobular, that's the same as interlobar, arcuate, inter, right? on the back side. There's no segmental veins. There's only segmental arteries. Okay, so that's the only part that's different there. Questions on blood flow through, through the kidney. So let's talk about the structure of the nephron. Okay, so blood comes in through an afferent arterial and then ends up in your What's that going to be then? John? The glomerulus. That's okay. And then it exits via the what? Efferent arterial. Okay? So blood is going to come in under a certain pressure and come into this glomerulus that has openings. Okay? And then that is going to be the first step in urine production. Those openings that's going to push the pressure, the blood pressure is going to go in and push fluid out of the capillaries. And then it's going to be caught by this part of the nephron. Okay? This first part of the nephron is what we call Bowman's capsule. Okay, Bowman's capsule. And we're gonna talk about, you're gonna see a couple of different things. You're gonna, you're gonna talk about renal tubules or renal corpuscles. A renal corpuscle is the glomerulus and the capsule. Okay, that's a renal corpuscle. From there, the next part. So this is the, really the first step in urine production. Blood comes in and pushes, what's going to end up happening is fluid's going to be pushed out of the glomerulus and it's going to, be going to be caught by the capsule. And it's going to be taken up by the capsule and then it's going to enter the, the nephron. Right? So the capsule's part of the nephron and then we get this windy part. First part, this is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And then it enters this big loop. That's called the loop of Henle or the loop of nephron. Okay? And then the, the fluid goes into the a distal part called a distal convoluted tubule before it enters. Whoops. a collecting duct. That's the basic structure of the nephron. Okay, so the nephron whole structure goes from Bowman's capsule to the collecting duct. Okay, and you have proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, most nephrons are out here in the cortex. Okay, so here's your renal cortex, shows your renal pyramid, you can see the collecting duct and where urine's going to collect. Most nephrons are what we call cortical nephrons. Okay, there's two types of nephrons. Number one, cortical. 
Okay? This one right here is a cortical nephron. Most of the nephron is in the cortex. Part of it extends into the medulla. Okay? And that's about 85% of the nephrons. The second one, nephron number two, is juxta medullary. Juxta means next to the medulla. This one over here is a juxta medullary nephron. The loop of the juxta medullary nephron extends deeper into the medulla. Okay? It has a longer loop and extends down. And that's about 15% of the nephrons in the kidney. What did I not include in this structure of the nephron in terms of blood vessels? What am I missing? What are those blood vessels that go around called, Case? Capillaries. What type of te capillaries? Peritubular <coughs> capillaries, right? So I didn't put in the peritubular capillary network, which would look something. like that, and then it would end up towards the renal vein, okay? Here's structure of the nephron from your book. Same thing, it's stretched out. You can see vas the afferent arteriole. There's a couple different parts. You have uh, the vascular capsular space between the glomerulus and the capsule itself, all right? And then the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle um, and the distal convoluted tubule. Now this is also showing that there are a difference in the epithelium of the tubes that are surrounding the lumen. Okay, so a little bit thicker, thinner down here, and a little bit thick again. Okay, that's, that's important because it allows for regulation of movement of solutes and water. All right, so the thicker the tubes, the it's going to regulate what goes in and out easier. Right over here as well, the thin segment is going to allow, allow different things to occur in and out. Okay? Questions on this structure? No? Awesome. Okay, here's another picture of the nephron, cortical nephron versus juxtamedullary. All right, you can actually see here part of, I want to mention, if you notice, if you were to follow this all the way around through this proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, you'll notice that part of this distal convoluted tubule runs back around and near the glomerulus. Okay? Part of that runs back. And that's important because it's an important structure that we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay? And that's what's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, okay? So it's a point of contact between the afferent arteriole and the distal convoluted tubule. So where it comes back before it enters a collecting duct right here, okay, it goes and it goes in close proximity to the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole. And within that, there's a, a group of cells called the macula densa. They are modified epithelial cells, and they work to detect changes in sodium and chlorine ions within the, within the fluid here. If this is too, too much salt, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? Okay? So they're important in recognizing this, because then they're going to they're gonna alter these, they're going to talk with these cells, okay, and help regulate the filtration that's occurring, okay? So those macula densa cells, are, they will signal granular cells within this, this apparatus to release renin, right? And we had renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. What does that do? Remember we talked about that in regulating blood volume? The renin-angiotensin system, okay, will increase... Right, will help regulate blood volume. We'll go over that again. Anyway. Right, so a couple different cells of that, the macula densa, the juxtaglomerular cells, that's over here, okay? 
So they're important. This is important in the, in the regulation of arterial blood pressure. Because if, if you regulate blood pressure, you're also regulating blood volume. Right? Those two things go hand in hand. Okay? So you can help regulate blood pressure by reducing blood volume. Right? You agree with that statement? Yeah. Right? So if you reduce blood volume, you're going to end up eventually reducing stroke volume, which reduces cardiac output, which then will reduce blood pressure. Okay? It's kind of a stepwise progression. Those things are related. So this is important in the regulation of, of blood pressure. Okay? So let's, questions on the structures that we talked about of the nephron and the kidney. Okay? So what the nephron does, it produces urine. Okay? It starts as, well, really it's a collection of three processes that are invo involved with the production of urine. The first one is glomerular filtration. Okay, as blood comes into the glomerulus, it's under high pressure or higher pressure. Right? It has a higher pressure than normal capillaries. It is the glomerulus has more openings than normal capillaries, so more fluid gets pushed out than normal capillaries. Okay? More fluid out and then and goes from there. <clears throat> Excuse. All right. So that filtration is the first step. All right. So that's what we call a filtrate. We'll talk about how that filtration occurs in a second. From there, that fluid that's collected in the capsule from the filtrate is then processed, moved through the the nephron, and you have a, two other processes: tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Okay. So it happens within the tubes, proximal tubes, the loop of Henle, the proximal tube, and the distal tube. Okay? So originally, a lot of filtrate is produced, more than you end up getting rid of in terms of urine. Okay? But then reabsorption is we're going to take a lot of the stuff that we've put out past the fil filter back. Okay? We're going to reabsorb stuff out of, out of that filtrate. And then the last part is secretion. Sometimes that filter, that filter excludes things that need to get out of. So if there's anything excess or extra that we need to get rid of, we will secrete that by active transport, usually by active transport, into the tube or into the collecting duct, and so it can be um, expelled from the body. All right, so you have... Tubular reabsorption is out of the lumen, out from the tube into back into the blood. Tubular secretion is from the blood into the tubes. Okay? So here's where those processes occur, basically. All right? Obviously, glomerular filtration occurs at the glomerulus. All right? So, and it's, it is dependent upon the pressure of the, of the blood flow coming into the capillaries. Okay, that's one way it's regulated. <clears throat> and then tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion have to do with the tubes of the nephron and the capillary, capillary network that surround the nephron, the peritubular capillary. All right, so that's gonna tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, and then the vasorecta, also part of that peritubular capillary network or an extension of it, I should say, okay, with moving things in and out of the loop of Henle. Okay, so both tubular secretion and tubular reabsorption. The first step, filtration. Filtration is, by definition, is an exclusion based upon certain characteristics. In this case, the biggest, I guess, category or characteristic of exclusion is by size, okay? It is by size. That means small things go through, big things do not, okay? So the filter 
that we're talking about is actually made up of a types of cells that surround the glomerulus called podocytes. Okay, so this is a podocyte, and it has these extensions that kind of is the, the book describes it as an octopus looking cell, right? So it has these legs that extend out, and from those legs are little f small feet, pedicels as they're called. And those pedicels, they um, interweave with other cellular pedicels, kind of like your fingers like this, right? Interweave, and they form what's called filtration slits, okay? And only materials that are small enough to pass through those slits, okay, are allowed out of the glomerulus, the glomerular capillaries, okay? So it's based upon size. So the podocyte, in conjunction with the endothelium of the glomerulus, right, and the basement membrane of the capillary, make up what's called your filtration membrane. Okay, so this is what it looks like over here. Okay, so here on the left, you have the blood that's running through the glomerulus, and then you have your filtration membrane. So first part of that is the fenestrations, the openings, okay? This is the capillary, the openings over here, the fenestrations within the, cap, uh, within the glomerular capillary allow stuff to go through. And then the next step, so you have, that's number one. Number two is the basement membrane. And number three are your filtration slits. Anything that doesn't fit through there or has a distinct charge doesn't fit through, okay? Doesn't get pushed through. And you'll notice things on the left side don't get pushed through. They're too big. So you got large proteins, platelets, white blood cells, red blood cells. Those are too big to fit through the filtration slits, okay? So what you end up with as blood goes through the glomerulus and all of this fluid is pushed through the filter, you end up with on this side, on this side of the filter, something that looks, it resembles plasma. Okay? Plasma minus the proteins. Okay? Minus the proteins. Why, the, why not the, most of the proteins? albumin, fibrinogen, all of those proteins that are present in plasma, they're too big. They're too big, okay? You have very small amounts of proteins that are get through there. Very, very small proteins can pass through, all right? So the filtrate we're talking about here, so is not urine yet, okay? It's actually less concentrated than urine. All right, includes water, glucose, amino acids, ions, some urea, some hormones, vitamins, B and C, ketones, whatever can be found in the, in the blood plasma without the proteins. Questions on the filtration membrane and what it does and how it works. This is, again, just by size. Size and to a much lesser degree charge, okay? So some negative ions won't pass through. The, neg the filtration membrane is negatively charged, okay? And this filtration membrane has uh, inspired a lot of, been the inspiration for a lot of uh, technical stuff that we use in, in um, biotech all the time. So when we make the fluid that we can grow cells in, we have to sterilize it, okay? And so we run it through this filter, which is very small, so that bacteria can't fit through there, All right? So we've, we've engineered this, and it it's, was inspired by this um, membrane that we have here, okay? So as blood flows through these 
glomeruli filtrate is formed. Roughly up to 180 liters of filtrate is produced per day. Okay, how much, how much do you think you urinate in a day? Do you think you urinate 180 liters? Amanda says yes. Well, you have, go get checked out. Okay. 180 liters, right? That's like, it's like four, it's basically four liters to a gallon. Divide by four, you're looking at, uh, you know, 40 gallons of urine per day. You're not an elephant. You're not an elephant. Okay. So what's the point of this? What am I getting at? Most of this is reabsorbed. The filtrate goes through, but most, but most of it, like greater than, almost greater than 90% of it gets re reabsorbed, okay? So the filtration barrier excludes molecules based upon size and charge, and basically you have three categories of, of molecules that stay in the blood at this point, okay? Or you have three molecules, three categories of molecules that are in the blood as it comes in. You got the molecules that are freely filtered, mean that they pass through. That includes water, glucose, amino acids, ions, etc. Okay? The other things that are not filtered, they stay in the blood. White blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, large proteins, and then you get those things that are intermediate. Sometimes they get through, sometimes they don't. They're intermediate in size proteins. Okay? Normally, they do not get passed. But in some, t in some cases, they do. Usually, it's indicative of some type of disease state, okay? Whether it be too high blood pressure, whether it be um, attacking the cells that, of the, that make up the podocytes that make up the filtration membrane or something, then you end up with protein in the urine, and that's indicative of some type of problem, okay? <clears throat> so the filtrate resembles filtered plasma. Right? And, and with certain solutes and minimal amounts of protein. Protein in the urine is called protein urea. And it's indicative of, like I said, a problem with the kidneys or with the filter. So, what drives this? What drives this? I've already said it a couple times. What drives this process of glomerular filtration? Pressure. pressure. Okay? Pressure. It's really involved with the pressure of the blood going into the glomerulus, okay? And when we talked about capillaries, we talked about blood vessels, we talked about how much fluid gets out into the capillary, the, the, out of the capillary network. And there were two forces that were involved in that. The, pre the hydrostatic pressure, right? The pressure of blood flowing through the, the vessel pushing fluid out on one end of the capillary and on the other end was colloidal pressure pulling water back or fluid back in, okay? Those two pressures are also present here, okay? With an added pressure, so we have, we have hydrostatic pressure is gonna force, what we said, pressure out, okay? Now, so HP out, or it's about 60 milligrams of mercury, right? So that's the, that's the measurement. That's hydrostatic pressure that's the pressure of the blood flowing in. The fluid is gonna push fluid out of the glomerulus. But at the same time, there's colloidal osmotic pressure that's pulling water back in as, it's, as you're losing fluid, some of it's being pulled back in because of osmos, osmotic regulation, osmosis on either side. Okay, and that's nothing new. That's what we talked about when we talked about capillaries, right? That's all those proteins now are, are, are stuck in on one side, and then the osmosis doesn't like to be one way or the other, a higher amount of, of water on one side, and things get pu pushed back. So there's a, sl a, a slight amount of, of osmotic pressure back, okay? And then finally, where is this going? Where is this fluid going? It's going into the going out of the glomerulus into the capsule. Okay, thanks. Way to go, Dr. Valcruz. You know everything. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. That goes into the capsule. Okay. 
But if there is fluid, too much fluid already in the capsule, that is now hydrostatic pressure that's pushing it back. Okay, so there's a little bit of hydrostatic pressure because blood's flowing through there, you're making filtrate all the time. Some of it is pushing back because this can't move, move too fast through the tube. Back towards the blood, okay? So you're really balancing these two pressures. The pressure that's pushing fluid out of the vessel and the pressures that are pushing fluid back in, okay? So the balance of that, so if you want to, you know, you could tally it up, 60 minus the, opposite, the opposing pressures, 32 and 18, gives you your net filtration pressure. All right, in the grammar, it's about 10 milligrams of mercury. Okay? Bless you. So balance among these forces. Now I'm going to give you an, uh, an example. Okay? And those of you who are in my lab, you've already heard this. Okay? My daughter was diagnosed with hydronephrosis in utero, okay? Hydronephrosis means water in the kidneys. And it's a result of uh, urinary reflux. When the bladder contracts, it pushes urine back up towards the kidney rather than its normal one-way exit through the urethra, okay? And there's a whole different example why that occurs, okay? or, or you know, reason why that occurs. But when the urine goes back towards the ureter and back into the kidney, what, where does it go? It goes, and her urinary reflux was bad enough, it went all the way into the kidney. So her renal pelvis was much larger than it needed to be. What happens to the capsular hydrostatic pressure? Does it get, does it get, is it, does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? What do you think? So here's her kidney, right? So here's her kidney and ureter. But now it, everything's getting forced back this way and back towards the collecting duct, okay? And so now if you look at the collecting duct, urine's getting pushed back this way. So urine's getting pushed back normal, more than normal, against the normal flow, right? Now you have your distal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, all right, and then the proximal convoluted tubule, eventually to the capsule. And urine is still getting pushed back against, against the normal flow. What happens to the pressure within the capsule? It goes up, right? So the capsular hydrostatic pressure is, gonna, is going to be higher Okay, it's gonna increase, okay, because of all of this is coming this way, right? Everything's coming from the bladder, up the ureter, up the, up the way it, it wasn't going originally, and that's gonna increase hydrostatic pressure a lot, okay? That caused damage to her kidney, okay? It caused damage to the podocytes and the glomeruli that are in there, okay? Now her kidney only works about 25 to 30 percent. Luckily, you have two, and you only need one. Okay, but that's an example of what what ha the hydrostatic pressure, right? So this is a pressure that's forcing stuff to be back to stay into in in the blood. <clears throat> okay. Overall, what you end up with the blood kind of goes through these glomeruli all the time, and you have a GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, okay? This is a measurement of how much filtrate is produced. Roughly, it's 125 mils per minute in men, 115 mils per minute in females. If you calculate it out, you end up, and you can figure out that total plasma, all of your blood plasma is filtered every 30 minutes. Do you go to the, so 125 mils per minute in 30 minutes that would be what? Three liters, right? Over three liters of, of filtrate that's produced. 
you'd have to be going to the bathroom every 30, every 30 minutes to get rid of that. Probably every 10 minutes to get rid of all of that. Okay? The bladder is moderately full at about 750 mils. Okay? With three liters of stuff in there, you're going to be, you might as well just catheterize yourself. Okay? So, gives you an idea about the reabsorption that occurs after this. Okay? And this GFR is one way, one big way for us to control the production of <laughs> urine. Okay? And that's influenced by the diameter of the afferent arterial. All right, how much, that, that will control how much blood comes in, comes out. We'll stop there, we'll pick up, uh, we'll go over GFR and then tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion on Monday. Um, and hopefully we will finish urinary by Wednesday. That's, look for those video lectures. All right, so you have them. Also, also, good afternoon, let's get started. We left off talking about um, filtration rate on Friday, or oh, Wednesday, whatever. Um, so we left off talking about uh, Friday. Gamelia filtration rate, we're talking about, the fil this is really examining how much of the filtrate is made in the glomerulus in a period of time, okay? And we went through uh, talking about most of the plasma is filtered every uh, couple, every couple minutes, or about every 30 minutes or so, okay? And controlling this, how much filtrate is made, all right, to influences how much urine is made, okay? Filtrate is the beginning process. It's the first step in producing urine, okay? So if you regulate, if you don't produce more filtrate, if you produce less filtrate, you produce less urine, okay? If you produce more filtrate, you produce more urine, okay? Because this is the, is the basic, the, the starting point, okay? Filtration provides your raw materials to concentrate or dilute the urine from there, okay? So controlling this, is dependent upon some internal and external controls, right? Within, you know what I mean? Internal and external to the kidney, okay? So the kidney itself actually regulates this, and then some other controls outside of the kidney regulate this, okay? So, and this also is re directly related to blood pressure, okay? So if you look at this, okay? Anything that, any input or stimulus that disrupts or changes the amount of blood going into the glomerulus will influence and change filtration, okay? Filtration is dependent upon the blood flow going into the glomerular capillary, okay? So in this case, a decrease in systemic blood pressure, okay? The afferent arterioles dilate and more stuff comes in, all right, you get a widened point. <clears throat> and that's gonna end up, all right, this is what was called a myogenic response. We're gonna, myogenic, we're gonna call these, these smooth muscle cells on the afferent arteriole, all right, is gonna help to produce this, okay? Really, we're trying to maintain normal systemic blood pressure, okay? That's what we want to do is, is maintain this. So we want to have the amount of blood coming in, right, that's pushing filtrate up, out based upon net filtration pressure, and then equal to the amount of blood going out of the glomerulus. Right, that will, so that's blood pressure is, is related to blood volume, so this will help maintain blood volume. If you have not enough, right, or too much, you end up with, dis you end up with uh, ad adaptations to that, okay? You end up with stimuli effectors that help change that, okay? So if you have a high blood pressure, okay, that's going to help, right? It's gonna help to, to remove blood volume from the system, okay? So really what this is saying is not, is not a decrease or an increase, you, this is, in order to decrease blood pressure, right? That's the, that's the response. 
we increase vasodilate the afferent arterial more blood comes in more filtrate more urine blood pressure goes down okay this is normal maintenance and then to, in order to increase systemic blood pressure okay we constrict the afferent arterial less blood comes in less filtrate produced more uh, efferent arterioles, right? We retain water, we retain blood volume, we increase systemic blood pressure, right? So don't get this confused here, okay? So this is in order to decrease, in order to increase, all right? So make sure that is clear. Understood? Okay, good. Okay, so what happens? All right, extrinsic controls outside of the kidney. That's just the kidney itself, right? Within the kidney, we'll, we will myogenic response, and there's also tubular gramellar response that's probably secondary to that. Myogenic response regulates blood flow into and out of the glomerulus, okay? Some other extrinsic controls, okay? Sympathetic stimulation and atrial natriuretic peptide, okay? These are, one's a neuronal stimulus, right, from your nervous system. One is a hormonal stimulus. Okay, you'll see what happens here. So stress or emergency or even exercise, okay? That's going to send a sympathetic nervous system to the kidney, or in, uh, innervation to the kidney, and the granular cells, increasing angiotensin II. What does it do? What happens when you are stressed, when you are... Um, exercising, are you producing urine? No, you produce less urine, right? So what happens? Blood flow through here, right? Constricts, less blood flow, less filtrate produced, okay? And also, there's also a decrease in filtration surface area, less filtrate produced, okay? So it ends up in a decrease in your glomerular filtration rate Okay, and a decrease in urine production. Conversely, so you know, atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP, natriuretic, N-A-T-R refers to sodium, uretic means urine, so sodium in the urine. Atrial means it comes from the heart, okay? So this hormone is in response to blood volume, okay? So blood volume coming back to the right Atrium will, if it's, if it's too low it, or too high, it will produce this, this hormone, all right? If blood volume coming back to the heart is too high, increase in blood volume or blood pressure, right? The atrial wall stretches and they produce this ANP. Atrial natriuretic peptide means that natriuretic, so natriuretic means sodium in the urine, okay? That's gonna, in, that's gonna stimulate the body to release and excrete sodium in the urine, okay? Because you have a high blood pressure, high blood volume, we're gonna get rid of sodium, all right? But I want to write this down and I want you to pay attention to it, okay? In the terms, in terms of the urinary system, water follows NACL. Okay, water follows salt. In this case, we're really talking about sodium ions. Okay, so where the sodium goes, what's going to happen? The water goes with it. Okay, so by ANP being produced and causing the release of sodium, the excretion of sodium ions, it also goes with it water. Water goes with it, what happens to blood volume? it decreases. Decrease blood volume, you return this back to uh, blood pressure, back to normal, okay? So in this case, this is increased, this will increase GFR because we're gonna increase blood flow through, right? More filtration, you, you increase urine production, loss of sodium ions, and a loss of blood, uh, excess fluid, and a reduction in blood volume, okay? So this is a negative feedback mechanism, all right? It is stimulus is a increased blood volume. The result, 
right? It works against or it helps to reduce blood volume. Questions on that?